And lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with them a hundred and forty and four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. What do we see here? We see three things here, brothers and sisters. What are those three things? ¿Qué vemos aquí, hermanos? Se ven tres cosas. ¿Cuáles son? Where are the 144,000? Es que They're on Mount Zion, correct? En el Monte Sion, correcto. Who are the 144,000 with? Los They're with Christ. They're with the Lamb. Están con Cristo, con el Cordero. And what do they have? ¿Y qué es lo que ellos tienen? The Father's name written in their foreheads. El nombre del Padre escrito en la frente. Now we're not going to study all of that today. No vamos a estudiar todo eso hoy. We're, we're going to get to that. Eh, vamos a llegar ahí. But the Bible tells us the description of these 144,000. In fact, let's look at verses 4 and 5. La Biblia nos describe los 144,000. Vayamos ahí a los versículos 4 y 5. It says, These are they which are not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which followeth the Lamb, whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. Here we see a description of the character of the 144,000, those who will be living when Jesus Christ comes. Este es el carácter de los 144,000, los que van a estar vivos cuando el Señor venga. The Bible tells us in the book of Luke chapter 10. La Biblia nos dice ahí en Lucas 10. And as we turn to this text, how many of you desire to be one of those 144,000? Y cuando vayamos allí, ¿quién tiene el deseo de tomar parte de los 144,000? We, we need to be with who? Necesitamos estar con quién? We need to be with Jesus. Con Jesús. Okay. We need to have Jesus' name in our foreheads. Necesitamos tener el nombre del Señor en nuestras frentes. In other words, we need to have the character of Christ. En otras palabras, necesitamos ya desarrollar and el these, carácter de Cristo. And these things are easy, brothers and sisters. Y estas cosas son fáciles, hermanos. If we would simply put our minds to them and, 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 and surrender our wills, God can complete His work in us very quickly. Si simplemente nos entregaríamos hacia el Señor con nuestra voluntad, entonces el Señor puede lograrlo muy rápido. But we're talking about Mary and Martha this morning. Estamos hablando en cuanto a María y a Marta esta mañana. And let's notice what the Bible has to say about Mary and Martha. Notemos lo que dice la Biblia en cuanto a María y a Marta. It says now in verse 38 of Luke chapter 10. Versículo 38 de Lucas 10. It says now it came to pass as they went that he entered into a certain village and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was cumbered about with much serving, and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her therefore that she do what? Dile pues que. That she help me. Que me ayude. It says, and Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things. But one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part, which shall not be taken away from her. Now, I want to ask the question, what was the good part that Mary chose? Ahora, ¿cuál es la buena parte que María escogió? Okay, she was sitting at the feet of Jesus. Ella estaba sentada a los pies de Jesús. Okay, notice what your Bible says in the book of John chapter 12. Noten ahí en Juan capítulo 12. Okay, so we're talking about Mary and Martha. Hablando de María y de Marta. What was Mary doing? ¿Qué fue lo que hacía María? What was Mary doing? Sitting at the feet of Jesus. Estaba en los pies del Señor. What was Martha doing? ¿Y qué hacía Marta? She was serving. Okay. Los quehaceres. Notice what the Bible says here, just so that we can see this point, the character of the two. John chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Versículos 1 y 2 de Juan 12. It says, Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus uh, was, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. It says, There they made him a supper, and Martha did what? What did she do? She served. But Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. And so we see here in this text, what do we see Martha doing? Aquí en el versículo 2, ¿qué es lo que está haciendo Marta? See her serving. Notice what it says in verse 3. 
Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. So we see once again Martha serving and Mary at the feet of Jesus. De nuevo estamos viendo que Marta está sirviendo y María está en los pies de Jesús. A lot of times we look at Martha and we say, well, Martha was the bad one and Mary was the good one. Muchas veces vemos a Marta y a María y decimos, Marta era la mala y María era la buena. Uh, but in actuality, they, these both represent God's people, uh, the 144,000. Pero la verdad es que ambas representan al pueblo de Dios, los 144,000. Now I want to read a statement here to you. Una cita aquí. And this is taken from volume 6 of the testimonies, page 118. It says, all who work for God should have the Martha and the Mary attributes blended. Todo el quien obra por Dios debe de tener las atributos de Marta y María mezclados. A willingness to minister and a sincere love of the truth. Una voluntad para ministrar y el amor sincero a la verdad. So, what do we have to have? Así que, ¿qué es lo que debemos de tener? Who do we need to be like? Debemos de ser semejantes a quién? We need to be like both. Como María y Marta. We need to have these attributes blended together. Necesitamos tener los atributos de ellas mezclados. As Mary was at the feet of Jesus, Así como María estaba en los pies de Jesús, that, re that represents many of us today. Eso representa a muchos de nosotros hoy. In other words, we come to church and we listen and we listen and we listen, but guess what? En otras palabras, nosotros venemos y escuchamos y escuchamos, pero ¿qué? We're not doing anything. No actuamos. And then you have Martha who's doing everything. Y luego está Martha que hace todo. But she's not sitting at the feet of Jesus. Pero no está escuchando en los pies de Jesús. This morning, we're being told that there needs to be a perfect blend between the two. Esta mañana se nos está admoneciendo que debemos de tener una mezcla perfecta entre las dos. A willingness to minister and also a sincere love of the truth. Voluntad para ministrar y también el amor sincero a la verdad. Why was Mary always at the feet of Jesus? ¿Por qué fue que María siempre estaba en los pies de Jesús? And what does it mean to be at the feet of Jesus? ¿Y qué significa estar en los pies, estar en los pies de Jesús? The Bible tells us in the book of Matthew chapter 5. La Biblia nos dice en Mateo 5. Matthew the 5th chapter and we're going to look at verse 1. Versículo Matthew chapter 5. 1, Mateo 5, 1. Because we're going to see by God's grace what does it mean to be at God's feet, at the feet of Jesus, and, 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 and what, is, what is at His feet? Y lo que vamos a ver por la gracia del Señor, ¿qué significa estar en los pies de Jesús? ¿Y qué está allí en los pies de Jesús? Father in heaven, once again, we just ask and pray that your spirit would abide with us. Or there are many distractions taking place, people talking, or many things happening right now, people's minds in different places. And Lord, you have set this place, you have set the table before your people to be able to eat of your word. Amen. Lord, I pray that you will forgive us for being so disrespectful to you by just treating your things indifferent or just simply by not being focused. Lord, forgive us. And I pray that as we study, Lord, that we would hear your words. Lord, give us a respect. Give us honor, Lord. Give us what we need, Father, today. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. One of the things that we learned last night Una cosa que aprendimos anoche. was the reason that so many people can't focus on the truth. Es la razón por la cual muchos no pueden mantener el enfoque en la verdad. 
And we learn in the book, The Adventist Home, it was because people are so stimulated by the pleasures of this world. Y aprendimos en el hogar cristiano que es la razón, que la razón es por la cual, por la razón es que el pueblo está tan estimulado por las atracciones de este mundo. Their minds are constantly being stimulated by the things of the world so that when it comes to sitting down and, and, and studying God's word, it, it doesn't appeal to them. The everlasting gospel doesn't reach their hearts. It doesn't connect. Y que la mente está siempre tan estimulada por el mundo que cuando llegamos al punto de la palabra de Dios, no es suficiente, no les llama suficientemente la atención, la atención y no se pueden enfocar. Maybe that's our problem, maybe it's not. Quizá ese es nuestro problema, pero quizá no. But brothers and sisters, when we come to God's house, when we come inside these walls, Hopefully you think, or hopefully you don't think that you're just listening to me. Hermanos, cuando venemos a reunirnos aquí dentro de estas paredes, hopefully, ojalá y ustedes no piensen que vienen a escucharme a mí. Hopefully it's, it's not, oh, we're, we're going to hear Pastor Howard speak. Brothers and sisters, if, if that's our understanding, then we don't understand what church is all about. Ojalá y no tengan ustedes en el pensamiento que, bueno, vamos a escuchar al Pastor Howard, él va a platicar. Si así es, no entendemos correctamente el significado de la reunión. When we come to church, we've come to hear from God. Cuando venemos a la reunión, venemos a escuchar del Señor. We've come to hear what He has to say to us. Venemos a escuchar lo que Él tiene, a decir, tiene que decirnos por medio de su palabra. And brothers and sisters, we need to... We need to understand why we're here. Necesitamos, hermanos, comprender exactamente por qué estamos aquí. The Bible tells us here in Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, it says, And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, We know that Jesus here begins to speak the Sermon on the Mount. Sabemos que aquí el Señor en Mateo 5 empieza a darles una predicación ahí en el monte. But where did Jesus go to preach this sermon? Pero ¿a dónde fue que Él uh, estaba? He went up into the mountain, correct? Okay. Why did Christ go up into the mountain? ¿Por qué es que Él subió ahí al monte? Turn with me in your Bible to the book of Isaiah chapter 40. Vamos ahí a Isaías 14. Remember, we're studying what does it mean to be... Why was Mary at the feet of Jesus, and what does it mean to be at the feet of Jesus? Recuerden, estamos estudiando eh, por qué es que María estaba en los pies de Jesús y qué significa. Estamos en Isaías 40, hermanos, disculpen, Isaías 40. The Bible tells us here in Isaiah chapter 40, and we're going to be looking at verses 9 through 11. Versículos 9 a 11. It says, O Zion that bringeth good tidings, get thee up into a high mountain. O Jerusalem that bringeth good tidings, lift up thy voice with strength. Lift it up, be not afraid. Say unto the cliffs of, uh, unto the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Behold the Lord will come with strong, with strong hand, and his arm shall rule for him. Behold his reward is with him, and his work before him. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and shall gently lead those that are with young. There's many things that we can discuss about these verses here. But hay I want mucho, us to notice some things. Hay mucho que podemos ver aquí en estos versículos, pero les voy a llamar la atención a ciertas cosas. Where does God tell his people to go? A dónde es que el pueblo le dice, el Señor le dice al pueblo que vaya? En verse number nine. En el versículo nueve. He tells them to go where? And to the mountain. Al monte. Remember, where do we see the 144,000? We saw them in the mountain. El monte. Matthew chapter 5, where does Jesus go? En Mateo 5, ¿dónde es que el he goes Señor to the está? mountain. Okay. El monte. Okay. What is Jesus about to do on the mountain? What is he doing in the mountain? Notice what it says in verse 11. Note in el versículo 11. He shall do what? Feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with his arms and carry them into his bosom and shall gently lead those that are with young. What is God doing in the mountain? El Señor hace en el monte? What is he doing? He's feeding his flock. Está 
al pueblo. God is feeding his people. Está apacentando al rebaño. Now also as well, what does it say at the end of that verse? ¿Cómo termina el versículo? What does God have to do with many people sometimes as he's feeding them? tiene que hacer con muchos mientras él los está alimentando? He carries them. Why does God carry anybody? Los sostiene o los carga. ¿Por qué? If you had to carry somebody, what would that mean? Si uno tiene que cargar con alguien que significa help, right? que maybe necesitan they're weak. ayuda, quizá están débiles. Maybe they're spiritually, maybe they're physically weak. Somebody's broken a leg, and so you now you have to pick them up and carry them and help them along the way. Puede que estén débiles físicamente, ten, tienen un, una pierna quebrada y hay que cargar con ellos. So the Bible says that Christ, He's feeding His flock. He's carrying those that are weak. And then it says that He shall gently lead those that are with young. Who is that? Apacenta el rebaño, carga el débil, y dice, pastoreará suavemente a, lo, a las recién paridas. ¿Quién es la recién parida? She's talking about those that have children. This is talking about mothers. Uh, se, se refiere a las madres, los que tienen niños. How does God lead them? ¿Cómo es que el Señor los guía? Gently. Suavemente. Is God forcing them and, and pulling them and saying, hurry up? ¿Acaso el Señor lo trae la fuerza apresurándolos? No. Christ is gently leading them along. No, Cristo suavemente los va guiando. This is what the work of the Lord is. This is how Christ is. This is what he does. Esta es la obra del Señor. Este es su carácter. Es lo que él hace. But once again, where is he? De nuevo, ¿dónde se encuentra él? He's in the mountain. En el monte. So Christ is feeding his flock from the mountain. Turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Deuteronomy chapter 33. Deuteronomio 33. Deuteronomy 33. 33 de And we're going to begin in verse number 1. Y el versículo 1. Christ feeds his flock from the mountain. He leads them gently, those that are with young. He carries those who are weak. Él apacenta uh, el rebaño desde el, la montaña y guía suavemente a las madres y carga con los que están débiles. But notice what also happens on the mountain. Noten también qué más sucede en el monte. The Bible says, and this is the blessing wherewith Moses, the man of God, blessed the children of Israel before his death. And he said, the Lord came from Sinai and rose up from Seir unto them. He shined forth from Mount Paran and he came with ten thousands of saints from his right hand and went Uh, from his right hand went a what? Fiery law for them. Yea, he loved the people. All his saints are in thy land, are in thy land, are in thy hand, excuse me. And they sat down at thy feet. Everyone shall receive of thy words. What is God talking about here? ¿Qué es lo que el Señor dice aquí? He talks about how the people were where? At Mount what? Sinai. Menciona que el pueblo se encontraba en el monte Sion. And being at Mount Sinai, they were at his what? Does the Bible say they were at his what? Verse 3. Y el versículo 3, estaban ellos como? They were at his feet. And when they were at Mount Sinai, at his feet, what went forth from God? Siguieron en sus pasos. Bien, y estando allí, ¿qué salió de él? According to verse 2. De acuerdo al versículo 2. His law. So when we're at the feet of Jesus, what is one of the things that we're learning? Mientras estamos en los pies de Jesús, que es una de las cosas que estamos aprendiendo? His law. La ley. Wasn't that what Jesus was preaching when he was on the mountain in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, the Sermon on the Mount? Wasn't it the law that he was preaching? ¿Qué no es lo que el Señor predicaba en su discurso ahí en Mateo 5? Do you know when you read Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7 that that's the Ten Commandments? ¿Saben que cuando ustedes leen Mateo 5, 6 y 7 ahí se encuentra los diez mandamientos? What did the Bible say that the Messiah when he came he would do? What, he, what would he do to the law? La Biblia dijo, dice que el Mesías cuando venía iba a hacer qué con la ley? The Bible says that he would magnify it and make it honorable. Que la iba a magnificar y a... Y, <coughs> and so in that sermon on the mount Christ tells the people he says listen 
I say unto you, or you say that thou shalt not commit adultery, but I say unto you, if you look upon a woman to lust after, you've committed adultery already in your heart. Christ was magnifying the law on the mountain. Y el Señor les decía, la ley dice que no cometas adulterio, pero yo te digo a ti, si tú ves una mujer con deseo, entonces ya has cometido el adulterio. Él estaba magnificando uh, o amplificando la ley. And as Christ was on the mount magnifying his law. Where were the people? Mientras el Señor hacía esto de magnificar la ley, ¿dónde se encontraba el pueblo? They were at his feet. Ahí en sus pies. So God is feeding his flock at his feet. He's declaring his law at his feet. El Señor apacenta allí al rebaño a sus pies. Entonces también declara su, su ley a sus pies, en sus pies. The Bible tells us back in the book of Luke chapter 23. Lucas 23, hermanos. Luke chapter 23. Lucas 23. Notice what else it means to be at the feet of Jesus. Vean qué más significa estar en los pies o estar a los pies de Jesús. The Bible tells us in Luke chapter 23 and verse 33 and 34. Versículos 33 y 34. Are we all there? Amen. The Word of God tells us in verse 33 and 34, it says, And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him, and the malefactors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. It says, Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. Let me ask a question here. What was, what was Calvary? Una pregunta. ¿Qué fue el Calvario? It was a mountain. Fue un monte. And so once again we see Christ where? De nuevo vemos Cristo on the mountain. Donde? En el monte. Where's everybody else that's on the mountain with Christ? El pueblo? Where are they at? Where are they? ¿Y dónde está el pueblo? They're at his feet. Está allí a sus pies. As Christ is lifted up on this cross, everybody is where? Mientras el at Señor the feet of Christ. es levantado ahí en la cruz, todo el pueblo está a los pies de él. And what do we see taking place here, brothers and sisters? ¿Y qué se está llevando a cabo aquí, hermanos? What do we see taking place at the feet of Jesus? ¿Qué se lleva a cabo allí? What does Jesus say in verse 34? ¿Qué es lo que el, el Señor dice en el versículo 34? Forgiveness. Perdónalos. So what do we have taking place at the feet of Jesus? Así que, ¿qué se está llevando a cabo allí? El perdón. What does it mean that Mary was sitting at the feet of Jesus? She was learning of his law. She was being fed by her master and she was receiving what? Forgiveness. ¿Qué hacía María a los pies de Jesús? Ella estaba aprendiendo de su ley, recibiendo de su verdad y también recibiendo su perdón. This is what it means to be at the feet of Jesus. Es lo que significa estar a los pies de Jesús. And the Bible tells us how often are we to be at the feet of Jesus. Y la Biblia nos dice que qué tan frecuentemente hemos de estar a los pies de Jesús. Every day. Todos los días. Every day we're supposed to be learning of God. Every day we're supposed to be learning of His law. Every day we're supposed to be, if we have committed sins, be receiving forgiveness. Todos los días hemos de aprender de su ley, ser alimentado por él, y si estamos, y si hemos pecado, recibir de su perdón. Let's just notice a couple of more things about the feet of Jesus in the book of Revelation chapter 14. Solo vamos a notar unos puntos más en cuanto a los, estando en los pies de Jesús en Apocalipsis 14. We saw very clearly that it was uh, that the 144,000 that they are on Mount Zion with the Lamb. Vimos claramente que los 144,000 están allí en el monte Sion, Sion a los pies del Cordero. So what does this mean about the 144,000? Así que, ¿qué significa de los 144,000? That they've learned of the law of God, that they've been fed by Christ, and that they've also received forgiveness. Han aprendido de la ley de Dios, han sido alimentados por el Señor y han recibido también su perdón. But I want you to notice in verse 12. Noten el versículo 12. The Bible tells us, it says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. I want to read that one more time. It says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So what else do we have at the feet of Jesus? Así que, ¿qué más podemos ver aquí a los pies de Jesús? What do we have? 
We have the faith of Jesus. Se ve la fe de Jesús. We have the patience of the saints. La paciencia de los santos. And so if we're to be at God's feet, we're supposed to be learning patience and we're supposed to be learning what it means to have faith in God. Así que si hemos de estar a los pies de Jesús, hemos de aprender también la fe, engrandecer la fe y aprender la paciencia. The Bible tells us in the book of Luke chapter 8. Lucas 8. Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8 and we're going to be looking at verse number 35. Y versículo 35. Lucas 8, 35. We can look after text after text. What does it mean to be at the feet of Jesus? But let's continue to, 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 to study this morning. Podemos ver texto en texto en cuanto al significado de estar en los, a los pies de Jesús, pero seguimos estudiando. Because we learn that we need to be like Mary, but we also need to be like Martha as well. Porque hemos aprendido blend. que hay que ser como María y como Marta, una mezcla perfecta. It says in verse 35 of Luke chapter 8. Versículo 35 de Lucas 8. Are we all there, amen? It says, Then they went out to see what was done, and came to Jesus, and found the man, out of whom the devils were departed, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. What do we see taking place at the feet of Jesus? ¿Qué se llevó a cabo aquí de nuevo, a los pies de Jesús? This man is clothed and in his right mind. What does this mean? Este hombre está, vini, está vestido y en su mente correcta. This man has been converted, has he not? Ha sido este hombre convertido, no? He was filled with demons, but now we see a change. We see conversion taking place. And so conversion happens where? At the feet of Jesus. Este señor estaba endemoniado, pero ya hemos visto que está vestido y está a los pies de, del Señor, está convertido. You know what's funny to me about that verse? ¿Saben que una cosa interesante de, de ese versículo? That at the end of the verse, that it says, when the people came and they saw this man clothed and in his right mind at the feet, feet of Jesus, what does it say about the people? Que dice que cuando el they pueblo vino y vieron que este hombre estaba en su mente correcta, temieron. What does that mean, brothers and sisters? ¿Qué significa eso, hermanos? There was, there was something wrong with the people. Que había un problema entonces con el pueblo. Here a man has been converted and yet they're afraid of this converted man. They, you know, he was more, they felt more comfortable around him when he was demon possessed and he, he wasn't wearing any clothes. Este hombre ya se había convertido entonces miraban ellos un problema. Se sen, sentían miedo y aún se sentían más cómodo parece cuando él estaba endemoniado. You know, it's interesting, brothers and sisters, because many people today, as long as we're acting like them and, and drinking and smoking and partying and living it up, guess what? They feel all right around us. But when we come to Christ and we're converted and our lives are changed, that's when people are afraid. They're like, wait a minute. Who are you? You're somebody different. Uh, uh, you've changed. I, I don't know about you anymore. Amen. Interesante porque cuando uno está participando del, del fumar y de beber alcohol y hacer todas las cosas que el mundo hace, el pueblo nos mira bien, pero el momento que uno es convertido y es cambiado, entonces la gente se retira de nosotros, tienen miedo de uno. Brothers and sisters, this is what it means to be at the feet of Jesus. Hermanos, esto es lo que significa estar a los pies de Jesús. Let's look at one more thing in the book of Matthew chapter 28. Mateo 28, hermanos. Matthew chapter 28, we're going to look at verse number, verse number 9. Mateo 8 y versículo 9. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 28 and verse 9, are we all there, amen? Versículo 9, todos allí. The Bible says, and as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, all hail, and they came and, be, and beheld him, and held him by what? The feet, and what they do? Worshipped him. Abrazaron sus pies y le adoraron. And so what else do we have taking place at the feet of Jesus? ¿Qué más, qué más se lleva a cabo ahí en los pies de Jesús? And so when we come to the house of God, brothers and sisters, we've come here to the feet of Jesus. Así que cuando nosotros hemos venido aquí a la casa de Dios, hermanos, 
hemos venido a los pies de Jesús. You're not at Pastor Howard's feet. You're at the feet of Christ, and you come to learn and to understand and to to gain a conversion experience and to worship God. No estamos a los pies del Pastor Howard, sino que estamos a los pies del Señor. Venemos a tener esa experiencia de conversión para adorarle al Señor. This is what it means when we come to church. Es lo que significa cuando uno viene a la reunión. The Bible says that when we come to the feet of Jesus, we come and we worship him. La Biblia nos dice que cuando venemos a los pies de Jesús, venemos a adorarle. The Bible tells us in we 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 move forward with Martha here now. What is what are the two what is the one word that you saw connected with Martha in both of the, those verses that we looked at? ¿Qué es lo, la, la, una palabra clave que ustedes pueden ver allí conectada con Marta? She served. Okay. Era sierva. She was serving, she served. Servía. Now we need to have Martha in us as well. Amen? Nosotros necesitamos tener Marta en nosotros también. Does the Bible call us to serve? ¿Acaso la Biblia no nos da el llamado que sirvamos? In fact, the text that we're all very familiar with, let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Romans chapter 12. Romanos capítulo 12. Romans chapter 12. Un versículo muy conocido. And we're going to look at verses 1 and 2. 1 y 2. Romanos 12, 1 y 2. Martha was serving. She was a servant. Martha servía, pues era sierva. The Bible tells us in the book of Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Are we all there? Amen. In Romanos 12, 1 y 2. It says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable one. Service. So what is our service to God? What is our service? Así que, ¿cuál es nuestro culto racional hacia Dios? That we present what? Our bodies to God. Que presentemos Wait a nuestros minute. cuerpos de qué manera? That means that I can, I can present my body to God, but, you know, when it comes to my tongue, I can take my tongue out and, and keep my tongue, and then I go and get on the altar, right? Mm, así que eso significa entonces que yo puedo presentar mi cuerpo hacia Dios, pero mi lengua la puedo sacar y ponerla allá afuera mientras yo voy a presentarme al altar. Well, wait a minute. What, what about, you know, it means that I can take out my stomach, I can take out my eyes and, and put those to the side and, and say, okay, Lord, I'm, I'm here, I'm, you know, I'm ready for service. Puedo entonces luego sacar mi estómago y mis ojos y ponerlos aquí y decir, bueno, Señor, ahora sí ya estoy listo para el servicio. Is this is what, what the Bible is talking about? Es lo que está diciendo la Biblia. When the Bible says that we present our bodies, it means everything. Cuando la Biblia habla en cuanto a presentar nuestro cuerpo, significa todo el cuerpo. Our eyes, our ears, our mouth, what we take into our bodies, everything belongs to Him. Los ojos, la boca, los oídos, todo es de Él. The Bible says that this is our service. La Biblia dice que esto es nuestro culto racional. Isn't that what it says? No es lo que dice. This is our reasonable service. Why is it reasonable? ¿Por qué es que es racional? Why is that reasonable? Because it's okay. It's his. Yes. Mm, porque pertenece a yes, él. Yes, that's true. It is his. But also, what did Christ give for us? Pero también qué fue lo que el Señor entregó por nosotros? Did he Did he keep something back? Did he withhold something? El retuvo algo. So it's reasonable when somebody gives everything to us that we do what? Give everything to them. Entonces es razonable que uno cuando reciba todo de alguien que uno también pueda regresarle todo. This is how marriage should be. Ese eh, debería, debería de ser el moda, modelo para el matrimonio. The husband gives everything to the wife. El esposo entrega todo a la esposa. And the wife gives everything to the husband. Y la esposa entrega todo a el esposo. Amen. Amen. But what does it mean? What is service? I should ask. What is service? ¿Y qué es ese culto? Turn with me in your Bible to the book of Numbers. Vamos ahí a, a Números. Numbers chapter 4. What is service? Números 4.
¿Y qué significa el culto o el servicio? The Bible tells us in the book of Numbers chapter 4 Numbers chapter 4 Números 4 And we're going to look at verse number 47. Y versículo 47. So what is service? What is service connected with in the Bible? ¿Qué significa o qué representa el servicio? The Bible says for 30, uh, from 30 years old and upward, even unto 50 years old, everyone that came to do a what? To do the what? Service of the ministry and the service of the burden in the tabernacle of the congregation. So what do we see service connected with? Ministry. Service is connected with ministry and also service is connected with what? The church, the tabernacle. El servicio está conectado con el ministerio y también está conectado con el tabernáculo de reunión. So, service is... Ministry. That's what, that's what service is. El servicio entonces es el ministerio. And we see ministry connected with the church. Y vemos que el ministerio está conectado con la iglesia. So when the Bible says that we give ourselves wholly to God, the Bible says that we serve God by doing what? Cuando la Biblia dice que hemos de entregarnos por completo al el Señor, dice que hemos de servir a Dios de qué manera? By doing ministry. Por medio del de ministerio. By doing service, by doing uh, service for the church. Por hacer servicio culto not, para la iglesia. And not just for the church, but brothers and sisters, if, if you're not doing ministry for God on your own, uh, <laughs> trying to, trying to, trying to uh, figure out a way to say this. Y hermanos, no solamente para la iglesia, sino que este... Uno también debería de estar conduciendo servicio fuera. Y si uno no lo está haciendo por sí mismo fuera. The reason why we find, many of us find it so hard to do ministry for the church is because we're not doing ministry for God for ourselves. La razón por la cual a muchos se nos, se nos dificulta hacer el ministerio, el servicio para Dios, es porque no estamos haciéndolo ni para nosotros Mismos. In other words, we're not doing ministry throughout the week for ourselves, so when it comes to doing ministry for the church, guess what? We don't want to do ministry. En otras palabras, no hacemos ministerio para nosotros durante la semana, entonces llega el día de venir a la reunión y pues tampoco estamos animados. And the Bible says that when we do service for God, service is connected with ministry. Y la Biblia nos dice que cuando hacemos el servicio para Dios, el servicio y el ministerio van de mano en mano. In fact, Turn with me in your Bibles to the book of 2 Chronicles chapter 31. Vamos allá a Segunda de Crónicas 31. 2 Chronicles chapter 31. And we're talking about Mary and Martha and the 144,000. What does it mean? Hablando en cuanto a María y Marta y los 144,000. ¿Y qué significa? In fact, we saw that Mary, she sat at the feet of Jesus and we saw what it meant to sit at the feet of Jesus. Y vemos que María estaba a los pies de Jesús y qué significaba. And now we're looking at Martha and what does it mean uh, to do service for God. Y ahora estamos viendo a Marta. We're looking at Mary. Uh, looking at Martha and we're seeing what does it mean to do service for ahora God. Ahora estamos viendo a Marta y qué significa hacer el servicio para Dios. Okay. Because we read in the Spirit of Prophecy that there has to be a perfect blend between the two. Porque hemos visto en el Espíritu de profecía que debe de haber una mezcla perfecta entre ambas. The Bible tells us in 2 Chronicles chapter 31 and verse 21. La Biblia nos dice en Segunda de Crónicas 31, 21. The Bible says, and in every work that he began in the service of the house of God and in the law and in the commandments to seek his God, he did it with what? All his heart and prospered. Lo hizo de todo corazón y que fue prosperado. So when this person did the service, when Hezekiah did service for God, the Bible says that he did it with what? All of his heart. Cuando Ezequías hacía culto para el Señor, dice la Biblia que lo hacía de todo corazón. In other words, there was a burden that he had. En otras palabras, él tenía ese deseo y esa carga. He had a burden for service. Para hacer. He had a burden to serve and to do as God had commanded him to do. And he didn't, it wasn't uh, something that was, uh, you know, that was, 
he had to do, he was forced to do, he did it because he wanted to do it. En otras palabras, no era una cosa que tenía que cumplir a la fuerza, no, él tenía el deseo para cumplir. And brothers and sisters, I want to tell you something that personally I wasn't a person who wanted to do anything in the service of God. Y yo les quiero decir algo, hermanos, que yo en un tiempo personalmente no tenía deseo de hacer nada para Dios. I mean, I, I would do it if you asked me to do it. Bueno, yo lo haría si tú me lo pedías. But when it came to just doing it on my own, I didn't do it. Pero llegando al punto de hacerlo por mí mismo, no lo hacía. And so guess what I did? Entonces, guess what I began to do as, as I was in high school? ¿Qué es lo que yo empecé a hacer luego allí en el colegio? I began to pray for a burden to do service. Empecé yo a pedir al Señor a rogarle para que me diera ese deseo de cumplir con él. I began to pray and say, Lord, the desire and the will and the burden that you have for souls, give me that burden. Yo empecé a pedir al Señor, Señor, el deseo y el amor que tú tienes para las almas. Dame a mí ese deseo. I began to pray, and these are the these are my specific prayers. And I said, Lord, how you see people, how you look at people, let let that be my vision about people. Let me see people in the same way. Y este fue mi pedido específico. Yo le decía, Señor, así de manera que tú ves a la gente, yo también quiero verlos de esa misma manera. And as I began to pray those prayers, the Lord began to answer those prayers and. I felt a burden for souls that I couldn't just look or pass by people. I had to say something to them about the love of God. Y así como yo empecé a pedir al Señor eso, yo empecé a ver las almas aún angustiadas o con problemas y no podía pasarlos sin testificarlas. The Bible tells us that when we do service for the Lord, we're to do with all of our heart and God will prosper it. La Biblia nos dice que cuando hacemos el ahora para el Señor de todo corazón, el Señor lo va a prosperar. The Bible tells us in the book of Isaiah chapter 42. La Biblia nos afirma en Isaías 42. Isaiah chapter 42. Isaías 42. We'll see something also that is connected with service for God. Otro punto que está conectado con el servicio para Dios. We're looking at Isaiah chapter 42 and verse 19. Isaías 42, 19. The Bible says, Who is blind but my servant, or deaf as my messenger that I sent, who is blind as he that is perfect, and blind as the Lord's servant. What do we see here connected with uh, the word servant? ¿Qué, es, ¿Qué palabra vemos aquí conectada con siervo? We see his servant, he calling his servant something else in these verses. ¿Qué él se refiere a su siervo como otra cosa aquí? He calls his servant his messenger. Es su mensajero. Okay, we see that in the first part of the verse there. So we see that connected with service, connected with ministry is a what? Is a message. Okay. So when we do service for God, there is a message that we have to take to the people. Así que vemos que junto con ser siervo de Dios, también uno llega a ser mensajero y tiene que entonces llevar un mensaje al pueblo. The Bible tells us in Isaiah chapter 43, we'll also, we'll also see something else. Isaiah chapter 43. Isaías 43, otro aspecto. So God has given us a message to take to the people as we do service for him. El Señor ha dado a su pueblo un mensaje para llevar más a su pueblo mientras uno hace el servicio. The Bible tells us in Isaiah chapter 43 and verse 10. Isaías 43, 10. It says, Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen that ye may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. So the Bible tells us that as we're the servants of God, we are his what? Witnesses. Okay. La Biblia nos dice que conforme seamos sus siervos, también somos testigos de él. Now let me ask this question. What is a witness? ¿Qué significa testigo? Somebody that testifies, yes. Huh? What else? What, else? what else is a witness? Okay, be a part of something, yes. 
uno, okay. algo que uno testifica, una cosa que uno experimenta, del cual uno testifica. Okay. Think about a witness in a court. Okay. When they call a witness, this wit they're calling the witness because what? ¿Qué del testigo en la tribunal? Le llaman al testigo por qué? They saw something, right? They were there. Ellos han visto los hechos, estaban presentes. They saw or they heard something. Eh, vieron o escucharon algo. So when God says that we are his witnesses, cuando Dios nos dice que somos sus testigos, what does this mean, brothers and sisters? ¿Qué significa? This means we need to see Jesus and we need to hear his voice. Que necesitamos entonces ver a Jesús y escuchar su voz. You see, you can't testify of something that you have not witnessed. Uno no puede testificar de una cosa que no ha visto. How often are we supposed to witness Christ? How often are we supposed to see and hear Jesus? ¿Qué tan frecuentemente uno ha de testificar y hablar en cuanto a Jesús? Daily. Diariamente. And so daily as we hear and as we see Christ, we daily have something to testify about. Así que diariamente mientras escuchemos y veamos al Señor, diariamente también tenemos de qué testificar. Many of us struggle about giving a testimony or testifying about something because we're not hearing or seeing something every day. Muchos luchamos en cuanto a un testimonio porque no estamos viendo ni escuchando algo todos los días. And because we have not spent, we have not heard the voice of the Lord, we have not spent time with Him, we cannot give anything to anyone. Y porque no hemos pasado tiempo con el Señor, no podemos compartir nada con nadie. So therefore we cannot be His witnesses. Por lo tanto, no podemos llegar a ser testigos. But God says in being, in serving me, y el, y el Señor dice en servirme, uh, we do ministry. Hacemos el ministerio. How are we to do ministry? ¿Cómo es que uno ha de cumplir el ministerio? How are we to do it, brothers and sisters? ¿Cómo ha de hacerlo? How are we to do it? What do we learn? ¿Qué hemos aprendido? With all of our hearts. De todo el corazón. It's supposed to be a burden. We have a message to take and we have something to witness about. Debe de ser un gran deseo. Tenemos pues un mensaje y algo de que testificar. I want to share... A couple of more texts with you. Mm, voy a compartir close. unos cuantos más textos. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 49. Isaías 49. Let me show you something that the Lord desires to do. Compartir algo que el Señor desea hacer. Father in heaven, as we begin to close this service. Lord, my heart is burdened. It's burdened. Because even in the midst of so much truth, there can be those who, who have not yielded to you. And I recognize that history is repeating itself, that even as Jesus walked upon the earth, the same things were taking place. Father, help us to not miss what you're saying to our hearts. Amen. For these words are not from me to the people, but from you to the people and to me. So, Lord, wake us up. Break the stupor and the darkness that Satan has placed over us, that we would hear your voice. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Mary and Martha represent God's people a perfect blend of service and also sitting at the feet of Jesus. Maria y Marta representan el pueblo de Dios, una mezcla perfecta de, de servicio y de estar al pie de Jesús. In Isaiah chapter 49, verse 5 and 6, Isaías 49, 5 y 6, 
the Bible tells us, it says, And now saith the Lord that formed me from the womb to be his what, brothers and sisters? Do you, do you see that, brothers and sisters? Did you just read that with me? Did you just read that with me? Acaban de leer ustedes eso, hermano, conmigo. Did you just read that with me? Why did God form you? ¿Por qué es que el Señor te formó? Why did God make you? Why did God allow you to come into this world Porque so that es you que el can Señor te trajo aquí al mundo? So that you can act like a fool in the world? Para que llegues y puedas llegar a ser necio so that we en can, el mundo? So we can we can reject and and be cantankerous and and obnoxious and and just evil people? Para que podamos llegar a ser necios y enfadosos y malas gentes. So that we can be worldlings and be popular in the world. Para que lleguemos a ser mundanos y llegar a ser populares en el mundo. The Bible says that the reason that God formed us in the womb was to be His servant. Dice la Biblia que la razón por la cual el Señor nos formó es para que seamos siervos. When we recognize and truly understand what that means. There will be no problems that we have. And what I mean problems, in other words, we won't be creating problems and we won't allow other people's problems to become our problems. Cuando verdaderamente captamos el significado de esto, no vamos a causar problemas y no vamos a permitir que los problemas nos perturben tampoco. God has called us to be servants. El Señor nos ha llamado para ser siervos. But now this is, this is speaking to you and I today, right now. You know how I know? Notice what the rest of the verse says and the verse right after. Pero esto directamente nos está hablando a hoy, esta, esta tarde. ¿Cómo sé? Porque noten los siguientes versículos. It says, And now saith the Lord that formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring who, brothers and sisters? Para hacer quién? Come on, you, you, you're not with me. To bring who? Jacob again. To him, though Israel be not gathered, yet shall I be, glor be glorious in the eyes of the Lord, and my God shall be my strength. Wait a minute. So the first thing why God has called us to be his servants is to bring who? Who is this talking about? Así que la razón por la cual el Señor nos ha creado para ser siervos es para traer a quien? A Jacob. ¿A quién se refiere? Who's Jacob? ¿Quién es Jacob? He's Israel, right? Amen. Jacob's name was turned into Israel. Él es Israel. Okay. So when the Bible says that God has called us as a servant to bring Jacob back, what does this mean, brothers and sisters? Así is que, it talking about bringing Jacob from the dead? Is it talk, what, what is this talking about? Cuando se refiere a traer de nuevo a Jacob o a Jacob, ¿qué refiere? ¿Qué significa? In other words, God has called us to go to the church. And we have a work to do where? In the church. To bring the church back to who? To him. Así que en otras palabras nos está diciendo que tenemos que ir a la iglesia y regresar o traer de nuevo su iglesia a él. Did you see that, brothers and sisters? Ustedes vieron I mean, eso, hermanos. Am I seeing things? O acaso yo estoy viendo cosas. The Bible says, you as my servant, I called you to go to the church and bring the church back to me. La Biblia ha dicho, tú como mi siervo te he llamado a ti para que vayas a la iglesia y me traigas de nuevo la iglesia. But it doesn't just stop there. No termina allí. The Bible says in verse 6, and it says, and he said, it is a light thing that thou shouldest be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved of Israel. I will also give thee for a light to who, brothers and sisters? The Gentiles that thou mayest, uh, that, that thou be my salvation unto the end of the earth. So God says, I've not only called you to go to Jacob and to bring back the preserved. What's, uh, what's another word for preserved? This is the remnant. I've not only called you to go to the remnant and, and to restore them, but I've called you to go to the Gentiles and to be my light throughout the earth. Así que dice que no te he llamado solamente para ir con el remanente, dice sino que vayas a el gentil y a los fines de la tierra.
you know, as I was reading that, it really, it really hit me, brothers and sisters. Mientras yo leía esto, hermanos, me impresionó grandemente. This is why God allowed us to be born. Es la razón por la cual el Señor nos dio la vida. This is why we're here. Es la razón por la cual estamos aquí. We're not here for any other purpose. No tenemos ningún otro propósito. But for service. Sino el servicio. Amen. And instead of, we're told in the spirit of prophecy that instead of pointing our weapons inward, y en vez de poner nuestras armas así para adentro, de acuerdo al espíritu de profecía, we need to point them out. Hay que poner nuestras armas así para afuera. We don't need to point our weapons toward one another. No necesitamos tener las armas así unos a los otros. If we point our weapons to one another, brothers and sisters, who is going to remain? Si hacemos eso, hermanos, ¿quién va a permanecer? Who remains, brothers and sisters? If we all had weapons in this room and started fighting one another, who would remain alive? Si todos estamos armados y estamos peleando unos con los otros, ¿quién va a permanecer? No one. But yet that's what we've chosen to do. Y aún eso es lo que hemos decidido hacer. But God is telling us this morning El Señor nos está diciendo esta mañana that He wants us to remember why we were born. Que Él quiere que recordemos por qué es que nos dio la, la vida. God has called us into this world to be His servants, to be a light unto the Gentiles, but also He's called us to sit at the feet of Jesus. Dios nos ha llamado para que seamos siervos, luz a los gentiles, y aún para que estemos a los pies de Jesús. Brothers and sisters, God is calling you this morning. Y hermano y hermana, el Señor te llama a ti hoy, este día. He's saying, I don't want you to be Mary, I don't want you to be Martha, I want you to be both. Está diciendo, no quiero tú que seas María o Marta, sino que que seas ambas. I want the blending of the two to be manifested in your life. Yo quiero que la mezcla de las dos se manifieste en tu vida. I want you to sit at my feet but I also want you to do a work that I've called you to do. Quiero que estés a mis pies pero también quiero que hagas la obra que yo tengo para ti. If it's your desire this morning to do that brothers and sisters I'm going to just ask that you would kneel with me. Si es tu deseo esta mañana cumplir con eso hermanos les pido que se postren conmigo. Lord God of heaven Lord these things I take very serious because I know how you called me and the work that you did for me Lord in bringing me back and restoring me mm -hmm. and helping me to understand my purpose yes, in life Amen. and Lord you want each and every one of us here this morning to understand why you called us. You haven't called us to live unto ourselves or to get a good career or to live in this world. You've called us to be your servants. And you've given us a mighty work to complete and finish. And Father, I pray that instead of turning the weapons of our warfare against one another. Lord, we have enough to fight as it is personally, let alone fight one another. But Lord, help us to take the weapons that you've given to us and fight your battles, the battles of the Lord. Yes, Lord. And Lord, help us to fight those battles in our own lives first. Lord, that we would have victory and that we would have an experience as we sit at the feet of Jesus, as we are converted, as we saw that man sitting at the foot, feet of Jesus, fully clothed and in his right mind. Lord, help us to have that experience. Amen. 
Lord, help us to come and to have that experience each and every day, not just a one-time deal. But Lord, this is something that we need to do daily. Father, I pray that you would help us to, Lord, do service for you each day as we witness your words, as we hear your voice, as we spend time with you, as we see your face. Lord, I pray that we would be able to, uh, that you would place somebody in our path that we can share what we have learned and what you have told to us. Even now, Father, I pray that you would help us as your children to be that perfect, perfect blend. Lord, help us to have a willingness to serve and also, Lord, a sincere love of the truth. Amen. This morning, Father, we ask once again that you would forgive us of our sins. Where we have failed to do this, Lord, forgive us. But Father, I pray that you would help us to not look back. I pray that you would help us to go forward and to press forward, Lord, to the things that you have called us to do. Thank you, Father, for all that you have done. Thank you for your word. And Father, may we be doers of your word today. It's my prayer. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Amen.